is not any longer being here in the Congress of the United States or being in your office. I think the danger is, and many members experience this, uh, travel to and from your office in Washington, much, so, much more so uh, in public transportation or private transportation uh, on the airlines, uh, on trains. Uh, obviously, if you're in a private car, you're in pretty good shape. But I think there is a, a concern of members who were confronted by MAGA hat wearing uh, individuals uh, who verbally uh, assaulted our members. Uh, I don't know that there were any physical confrontations, but there was no doubt that our members were very, very concerned and uncomfortable on planes uh, with uh, people who recognized them or even if they didn't recognize them, talking boisterously about how proud they were of uh, committing this seditious act in the Congress of the United States, on the Congress of the United States, trying to intimidate the Congress of the United States and prevent them from doing their jobs. So I, I think the answer, George, is I think here on this campus, I think this campus is pretty tucked down right now. Uh, we have uh, uh, thousands of uh, National Guard, armed National Guard, uh, our Capitol Police, FBI, Maryland, uh, Maryland and Montgomery County, Fairfax, Arlington, I think, are also cooperating. I don't know that any of them are on the ground now. They were on the, uh, the night of the 6th and the morning of the 7th. But I think the, the, the worry is at home and, and traveling to home. Uh, and uh, uh, members are, are urged to call their law, like local law enforcement so that local law enforcement can be looking out for them. And very frankly, if there's specific threats to members, the uh, Capitol Police uh, will be uh, alerted and will be available to uh, uh, assist. Congressman, stay safe. Thank you for your time today. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Number of Republican yes is now up to nine, as we're seeing the, the vote continue there on the House. Impeachment of President Trump for the second time, as we've said, never happened before in American history. There's the numbers right there, nine Republicans, 192 Democrats. We still have about 50 members of Congress left to vote. Right now, I want to bring in Sarah Fagan, Republican strategist. And, and, and Sarah, it, it was striking. I, I was surprised that more House Republicans, at least those who spoke, we'll see what the final number of votes are, did not... Uh, take the tack that we saw from Kevin McCarthy. What the president did was wrong, but it may not rise to an impeachable offense to be done in this way at this time. Yeah, I think that these numbers to me are a little surprising. I, I recognize there are certainly uh, nine more than voted for impeachment the first time, but I would have expected this to be higher by Republicans, and I would have expected more Republicans, even if they disagree with impeachment for a variety of reasons, uh, that they would have more forcefully spoken out against the president's actions and his behavior, not only last Wednesday, but in the days after Wednesday. Uh, it took him almost a week to really acknowledge that uh, uh, this was completely inappropriate. Um, having said that, uh, you know, this is politics at play. Uh, Rahm, who spoke uh, a bit ago, had suggested censure. Uh, on uh, last Wednesday evening, that would have gotten many, many more Republicans. Democrats don't want that. They want the politics of the impeachment. Republicans, on the other hand, they don't want primaries. And one thing that I am certain of is if you pop your head up and raise your hand, even if it's the right thing to do, you are asking for a primary. These members of Congress will be firing up the election machine here in about two months for the next election. And that is top of mind, unfortunately. We'll see it play out differently in the Senate, where people have six years in between cycles. They have a longer uh, time to sort of get past some of these tougher issues. Okay, Sarah Fagan, thanks very much. As you pointed, this is a political process. It's basically he's got legal trappings inside a political institution. So let's bring in our legal team for more on this as well. And, and Dan Abrams, I, try to assess it from that perspective. If you're looking at this, looking ahead to the trial in the Senate, assess the arguments you were seeing from each side. Which were the strongest points? Well, first, let me focus on what we didn't hear. Not a single Republican member of Congress said this election was stolen from Donald Trump, that that's a travesty. Why is that important? Because that's why the rioters were there. They were there because the president told them the election was stolen. And yet not one member of Congress today said the election was stolen. Matt Gates said there were concerns, et cetera. And, and, and that's significant 
on the argument about the double standard. And something we heard again and again about, well, why didn't Democrats condemn their own? That's a fair conversation to have. But not all incendiary language is created equal. And that's clear, because when you allege that literally the democracy is broken, that the guy who actually won the election isn't getting to stay there, you are stirring up a lot of trouble. And not a single member of that House today was willing to go that far. And so I think when evaluating the arguments as we see what's going to come in the Senate, I do think you're going to hear a little less of the invective, a little bit less of the Matt Gates type arguments in the Senate, and more of the sort of process argument. More, I think, you're going to see arguments about federal law and the law of incitement, saying that it didn't reach that level, um, rather than the sort of purely, some of the purely political arguments we heard today. But, but I do think it's so important to focus on that, because more than half of Republicans still believe that the election was stolen from Donald Trump. It's a lie. It's not true, and it's incredibly incendiary, and that's the reason you didn't hear it today. And that's a good point. Let me bring that to Kate Shaw as well. Kate, I would imagine the Democrats, when they go to the trial, will be talking a lot more about that pattern of lies since Election Day, that phone call to the Georgia Secretary of State, in, in addition to the inciting of the riot uh, last week. I would expect one more thing you're going to hear from Republicans is, especially if this starts after Joe Biden is inaugurated, basically, what's the point that he's out of office now? It's not proper after the president leaves office. I, I, that's right. I think that the Senate trial arguments will probably largely track what's in the impeachment article, and that is, you know, really a focus on the events of January 6th, but situating those events in the context of the president's conduct and rhetoric over the course of the past two months. So it wasn't just January 6th. It's essentially everything that's happened uh, since the election. Um, so I do think you'll hear arguments like that. Um, I, I do think we heard today a lot of kind of why, what is the point? It's just politics from the president's um, supporters. Um, and I think the Democrats actually have and Republicans who will support impeachment um, have a lot of responses to that. You know, one, some kind of decisive repudiation of the conduct is important, even if there's only a week left in the term, might be important even after inauguration. Uh, two, deterrence of future recurrence of this kind of conduct, and then potentially disqualification from future office holding. So, all of those things, I think, are answers to the kind of what is the point question, uh, whether th that question is raised prior to January 20th or even if we do find ourselves uh, in a situation of having a Senate trial, as it looks like we will after inauguration. Well, there is a majority. Now you see it right there, 228 so far with 11 still to vote for the impeachment resolution. So it has enough votes to pass. You saw 10 Republicans have voted for it as well. So Donald Trump has indeed been impeached for a second time, the only American president to impeach twice. There are the numbers right there. 228 to 194. It's not the final number yet, but they have crossed over the threshold of a majority to impeach, Don impeach Donald Trump, it, which means a Senate trial of some form is coming. I want to bring in a former senator to talk about that now, Heidi Heitkamp, former Democratic senator from, from North Dakota. Uh, Heidi, looking forward to this impeachment that is a trial that is going to be probably coming in the next couple of weeks. Assess the prospects in the Senate. Well, George, if I can just kind of go back to Liz Cheney and think about what her father did two weeks ago. He uh, orchestrated a letter to be put for former secretaries of defense to warn the Pentagon, do not engage, do not do things that are unconstitutional. And then she comes out and says, makes a very strong statement. I think Congress doesn't know what they don't know. And that's really the danger of, of people assuming that everything you're going to know about the president's behavior is on the table. I find it interesting that Mitch McConnell is now waiting to have this trial. I think he expects there's going to be more very, very difficult facts coming out for the president. I think he has refused to say that he would not support impeachment. I think that he feels like his caucus would be in a better position to analyze all of this after the facts, more facts are known. And let's put on top of that the warning that we received yesterday from the um, acting U.S. attorney who said, we are going to be shocked by what we hear. Um, we can't be shocked by the behavior of renegades and insurgents. We, we will be shocked by the behavior of people within this government, whether it's in Congress or whether it is in the White House and, and surrounding 
surrounding the president, um, whether they were complicit in these attacks. And so um, I expect that we're going to find out more information. And once we do, a number of those congressional people who voted no today are going to be quite embarrassed. Heidi Heitkamp, thanks very much. We have one of those members of Congress with us right now, Dusty Johnson, Republican of South Dakota. I don't know if you were able to hear Heidi Heitkamp right there, but uh, she made the point that she believes that those who voted no today are going to be embarrassed as more facts come out, even more damning facts come out in the days and weeks ahead. Tell us about your vote, why you voted no. Well, I would say to Senator Heidkamp that I think that's why a snap impeachment was such a bad idea. If there are new facts that will be coming out in the next day or two or three, I think lots of members of the House on both sides of the aisle would have been interested in understanding that. I mean, this is the first impeachment process in history that didn't have a single uh, hearing. Nobody was able to call witnesses. I mean, with seven days left in the president's term, I do think we still need to be concerned about things like due process if we want to convince ourselves this is a legal process rather than just a political one. Do you agree with your leader, Kevin McCarthy, you said that the president bears responsibility for the events of last Wednesday? Oh, well, the president deserves uh, plenty of responsibility. I mean, his words and actions, uh, not just last week, but uh, leading up to that, uh, certainly made things worse rather than better. Uh, I, uh, I made that clear uh, last week, and uh, I think uh, it's not, I, I don't want to create in him a villain. There is a desire in the immediate aftermath of these tragic events to maybe explain them in overly simplistic ways, George. The reality is there are a lot of us who have been uh, trying to tap into this outrage, and we've been making it worse. A lot of politicians have been doing it for personal gain or political gain. This should be a wake-up call for our country. And I would just mention this, this one more thing. The rhetoric I heard on the House floor today was some of the most toxic partisan rhetoric I have heard. That has been my concern about the impeachment process. Uh, I, I just, I have a hard I, I, I do not believe it has moved us in the right direction. So how do you say, what's your argument, though, to the Democrats who argue that if you look at the totality of the president's actions since the election, lying about the results, uh, telling his supporters that it was a stolen election, encouraging them to go uh, to the barricades in the, in the Congress, and calling election officials, trying to get them to find votes that aren't there, how do you explain that? How is that not impeachable? Well, and first I would mention that, you know, I voted to accept the state certifications last week. I mean, I understand, uh, I mean, I, I didn't agree with the president on those votes last week. I mean, I felt like he was wrong. A lot of the rhetoric you just described was not helpful. And it's not the kind of thing we want to hear in a constitutional republic. I, I don't know practically what impeachment, though, George, I mean, it just seems like it is a political exercise because... We're not going to remove the president with seven days left to go. The Senate has made that clear. They don't have the time to do that. I mean, it takes you two months to try and convict uh, a convenience store robber. You know, high crimes and misdemeanors seems like it should take more than seven days. So what is impeachment after a president has left office? Conviction on its own does not bar him from running for federal office in the future. If this is just a, you know, a super formal scolding, it seems like Speaker Pelosi could have done that same thing with the censure, which would have been a lot more likely to gain uh, dozens, if not uh, more than 100 Republicans. Would votes. you have voted for a censure? Oh, I think it would have been something that I would have been really open to. I mean, I, I have said the president's, uh, lots of his actions and words did not help. And I think uh, there would have been a lot of people like me who would have viewed that as a very realistic option. But not a yes? Well, I mean, you need to see how it's written, right? I mean, the reality is that um, uh, words matter. Uh, facts matter, and I think the censure managers would have had to establish a good case. I, I don't have any doubt that they could have. My only hesitation, George, is that I've seen my colleagues on the left, too often they have overreached, and they have done so in a way that's made it difficult to bring Republicans on board. How do you see the next couple of years going in your term of Congress? Well, none of us, uh, I shouldn't say none of us, I certainly didn't go to Congress to want to engage in the kind of partisan petty squabbling that has, has seemed to dominate the last two years. That's not how I'm wired. I mean, I, I, I want to solve problems. I mean, I talk every day with, you know, bipartisan lawmakers where we identify areas that, that we, we want to move the needle. And that's been one of my concerns about the impeachment process. I 
the relationships between the Republicans and the Democrats in the House right now, George, this week is as bad as it has been in the 104 weeks that I've been in Congress. It is a sad state of affairs, and it is going to be difficult emotionally for us to recover uh, from what happened last week and what is happening this week. Congressman Johnson, thanks very much for your time today. Thank you. Let's check back in on that vote right there. You see the numbers right there, 231. Uh, votes now for the impeachment of Donald John Trump. Ten Republicans have voted yes this time. Again, remember, no Republicans voted for the impeachment of the president. That was just a year ago. Remember that. It was just a year ago this week that the House was preparing to send their articles of impeachment to the Senate uh, for a trial just a few days away from that. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is approaching the podium right now. You might notice that she is wearing exactly the same outfit that she wore one year ago for the impeachment of President Trump and that mace, that brooch on her on her lapel signifying the sergeant at arms the power of the sergeant at arms the authority of congress to rule itself let's listen in on the speaker She's not quite prepared to talk right now, but you see the numbers, the votes are there right now for the impeachment. She has not said, I asked uh, Congressman Hoyer when the articles are going to be sent to the Senate. She has not made that final decision yet. We wouldn't expect she would make it from the podium, but likely within the, before the close of business today, uh, she will announce uh, certainly by tomorrow when she will be intending to send this over. A big question will be when the Senate can, can accommodate that, of course, at least for the next several days, uh, the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, has the power to block and determine uh, how they come over. This, he would have to agree to having the Senate go into an emergency session to have any kind of a trial before the 19th, and he has already ruled that out. It is even possible that they will have the uh, Senate trial starting on as early as January 20th, just one hour after uh, Joe Biden is actually inaugurated as President of the United States, which is a reminder, David Muir, we have a huge week ahead after a week unlike any other in American it, history. I mean, it's just extraordinary to think that the Senate trial could actually begin concurrently with the inauguration of the next president. As we take a look at the just the, the physicality of what we're seeing around Washington, this enormous presence of troops, the National Guard inside the Capitol, uh, just one week after this attack, uh, we know from the U.S. Capitol Historical Society that not since the Civil War have we seen uh, the Guard and, and troops quartered in the Capitol as we have seen uh, getting rest in the hallways on the floors as they protect uh, the Capitol, not only for what we're seeing unfold here today, but as you point out, inauguration uh, quickly coming on January 20th. As you point out, the Senate Majority Leader, at least for the next several days, Mitch McConnell saying uh, he is not interested in bringing back the Senate any earlier uh, than then. So a very real possibility that this happens all on the same day. Uh, one thing to point out is there's a big difference in, in Mitch McConnell from the, the last um, Senate trial. Of course, going into the last trial, he said, I'm not an impartial juror here. Uh, he promised even in advance to work in total coordination with the White House, the president's legal team, saying there will be no difference between the president's position and our position, obviously meaning his own position. That's not what he's saying this time. Mitch McConnell saying that he welcomes the impeachment process. Please was the word first reported by The New York Times and then confirmed by our own Washington team. And it's been reported. Have all members uh, voted? Right there. Speaker Pelosi. Does any member wish to change a vote? Is she coming? No, can't go. Speaker is asked if any member wants to change. Appears to be a little indecision right now. Right now, 231 to 197, you see it right there. 221 Democrats, 10 Republicans, 10 more than voted for the impeachment of President Trump one year ago, have voted to impeach him a second time.
as Congressman Hoyer was saying, it will be the Speaker's job then to sign the enrollment papers, to send it over uh, to the Senate, and then they will start to negotiate the terms, whatever trial is going to happen uh, in the Senate. On this vote, the ayes are 232, the nays are 197. The res resolution is adopted. Without objection, the motion to reconsider is laid upon the table. It has passed. The gavel has fallen. 232 yes votes for the impeachment of Donald John Trump. Just extraordinary. It has happened twice now to President Trump. Only president in American history to be impeached twice, just seven days, less than seven days now, uh, left in his term. We haven't heard much from the president uh, today. We should be hearing from him at some point uh, later today. He's under some pressure to say more, uh, to speak out against the violence, the to lower the possibilities that he faces Lindsey Davis, an actual conviction in the Senate. You know, and historically, it's interesting to note that between the first and second impeachments in our country's history, we're talking about a span of 130 years. And now between the third and the fourth, just the 13 months. Uh, it's also interesting that going into today, you know, in the election, we heard so much from both sides talking about we're fighting for the soul of this country. And the election's over. The debate continues. We saw that fight again inside the Capitol today. Uh, both sides were saying that we've got to put people uh, before politics. Both sides were quoting uh, Abraham Lincoln. They were fighting the same point, but then arriving at a different conclusion. And one congressman summed it up by saying, are we going to condone through acquiescence or condemn through impeachment. In the end, they decided to condemn through impeachment. The majority is there. Yvette Simpson, uh, your thoughts on this historic day? You have been watching ABC's special coverage of the second impeachment of President Donald Trump. Our coverage continuing now here on Action News. And we begin with that breaking news here today. A second impeachment of Donald Trump is now official. The House of Representatives has just voted to impeach President Trump again, now sending their case to the Senate to decide his fate. It comes exactly one week after that deadly riot at the Capitol, which is now more secure than ever before. Armed National Guard members at every door and every turn. It is Wednesday afternoon, an historic one. I'm Brian Taft. And I'm Sarah Bloomquist. The big story on Action News is the historic second impeachment underway in Washington. Ten Republicans just siding minutes ago with their Democratic colleagues to vote for impeachment. ABC's Elizabeth Schulze has a look at how things played out today on the Capitol. In the same chamber that was attacked by pro-Trump rioters one week ago, House lawmakers now on the verge of impeaching the president for the second time. He must go. He is a clear and present danger to the nation that we all love. The vote expected shortly on a single article charging President Trump with incitement of insurrection by encouraging his supporters to march on the Capitol. A simple majority of the House's 435 members need to vote to impeach the president. That number clearly within reach with at least six Republicans joining more than 200 Democrats in support. With a heavy heart and clear resolve, I will vote yes on these articles of impeachment. ABC News has confirmed Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell believes the president committed impeachable offenses, and the third highest ranking Republican in the House, Liz Cheney, vowed to vote to impeach. But many other GOP members are still standing by the president. This is a reckless impeachment. This will only bring up the hate and fire more than ever before. The debate on the House floor taking place in a Capitol building fortified with security, and where gunfire rang out seven days ago. House Speaker Nancy Pelosi touring the perimeter in a starkly different image than at this time last week. More than 6,000 National Guard members are already in Washington, some even sleeping on the Capitol's floors. And defense officials say up to 20,000 guardsmen could be in the city before Inauguration Day in one week. And amid worrying new details, the FBI had warned that extremists were heading into Washington last week determined to wage war and with the possibility of more threats ahead, President Trump issuing a new statement, read on the House floor by one of his staunchest allies in Congress. I urge that there must be no violence, no lawbreaking, no vandalism of any kind. And ABC News has learned the Senate will not come back early to start an impeachment trial, so the earliest it could begin is January 19th. That could pose problems for President-elect Joe Biden's agenda. Remember, he will be inaugurated one day later, January 20th. Elizabeth Schulze, ABC News, the Capitol. 
Well, many of our local lawmakers were among those who voiced their opinions during that fiery debate today. Democrat Madeline Dean from Pennsylvania is one of the impeachment managers. And now Republican Jeff Van Drew from New Jersey, who changed parties during the first impeachment process that he opposed. Congress must be the glue that starts unifying everyone. By the time this process would conclude, the man they want out of office will no longer even be the president. If we want unity, this is not the way. This hateful rhetoric is another deadly virus. It is time to remove it from its host. To heal, we need accountability and truth. That begins by acknowledging the president's dangerous lies and their deadly consequences. Now, Van Drew, who you just heard call for unity there today, voted to reject the results of the election just last week. We'll hear from more of our local representatives coming on throughout the evening here on Action News. Security at the Capitol is now very tight. National Guard members started receiving their weapons this morning as they reported for duty. They are also securing perimeters set up around the Capitol complex. That includes congressional offices and other buildings. With members now working in shifts, employees arriving, to work this morning found guard members napping in the Capitol Visitor Center. The guard says many seen here are still awaiting their lodging assignments, adding the images show resilience and dedication. We will continue to follow all of today's major developments from Washington, D.C. throughout the evening. After Action News at 6, ABC's World News with David Muir will continue with live team coverage. Other news here this afternoon and beginning tomorrow, New Jersey will vaccinate the next group of residents. Today's announcement means that a lot more people are now eligible for the vaccine as the state tries to speed up that process. Action News reporter George Solis has the story now from a vaccination clinic in Gloucester Township. Well, as you can see, the site is now closed, but officials say the goal in the long run is to vaccinate some 500 to 1,000 people daily, including those now in the expanded vaccination plan, as long as vaccines are available. Following a change in federal guidelines, New Jersey is now massively expanding vaccination statewide. All New Jersey residents ages 65 and older, plus those between the ages of 16 and 64 with medical conditions. The change is taking effect this Thursday and now adds more than 4 million residents that will be eligible.